Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Weekender. This week, I am joined by Jerry and Ben on the screen. Welcome to the show, lads. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay, first things first. Next weekend, terrible, horrible, awful news. No Weekender. <coughs> because we're doing the 40K Hobby Weekend. Hobbit Weekend. Hobby. Hobby. <laughs> hobby. With hobbits. Hobby. Tiny people. I mean, Sam will be there, so. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> practically. Yeah. Practically yeah. that, then. <laughs> yeah, so basically, yeah, no weekenders next week because we're doing that, but we will be doing content from the event. And I'm super excited because I'm getting to take part. Yeah, you think that? <laughs> I'm going to get everybody to ask you how they play the game throughout the entire weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to at, my at, world, at, son. At, at which point I'll point and go, you can ask him. Oh, I don't play 40k. I'll send it back to you. He's the one, <laughs> no, who, knows, no, he's no, the one no. who knows the 144 dice centurion rules. So, so hang on, we're basically playing boot camp or ping pong? Yeah. Okay, this sounds like a great plan for the weekend. I like it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you're coming along to the boot camp, uh, basically what you're getting is your start collecting set, your dice bag, token set, 15 quid paint voucher, and can of primer to get you up, running, and going. The real key of the weekend is to get hobby done. But we do have three massive 40k tables that we've been vlogging, uh, basically the construction of. It has been rather epic. We almost needed to unionize John. <laughs> no, I don't want to unionize him. If you unionize him, he wouldn't be doing that amount of work. <laughs> You'd find that there'd be quite a lot of, you know, mm, tea breaks required, EU law, yeah. tools yeah. down, get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing he would probably just do a small set of space marines with placards when he goes on strike, just <laughs> put them on the table. Work time directives. It's all the Imperial Guard all the time. <laughs> the, uh, the other key thing that we've been talking about, and we did a, put a video out at the start this week, is that we're asking for your input on exactly what you want us to do with those people that have digital tickets and for everybody else out there as well who's going to be following along with the live blogs. So do you want us to do live streams? Do you want us to do Q&As? Do you want us to do some nice tutorials, something like that? A live ha uh, hobby hangout, stuff like that as well. So we'll have a link in the show notes so you can go and follow that through and tell us what you want to tell us what you want us to do for you at this 40k hopper weekend yeah and we have a couple of epic prizes up for grabs for those who are coming mm -hmm. along and participating digitally so we have two chainsword kits up for grabs yes so not the full done chainsword but the kit so you can actually make one yourself mm -hmm. means you can also carry it home with you yeah that'll be fun <laughs> going through airport security well it's easier to take the kit than it is to take the fully built thing. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, anything else we want to say for the 40K weekend? Are we excited? Are we looking forward to it? I'm really looking forward to seeing what people do because we're going to have the uh, the project system set up with a nice tag and everything so you can collect everything together to show off what you're building over the weekend. I know a lot of people are already going to be running some live streams and all kinds of things on Twitch and things, so it would be nice to follow what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, just seeing all the pictures and stuff that you guys put together and you painting your things. I'm very interested to see how many people start painting things with contrast and how many people start doing it the traditional method as well. So it would be very cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like, my own plan is I'm going contrast all the way. I want to get my stuff painted as quickly as I can because... Yeah. Uh, me being me, I've not been able to resist buying stuff in for the army before I get the army. <laughs> that, that makes sense. I'm looking forward to seeing what Templar does because uh, I think mm. he's going to be filming from his um, otter studio in his basement, and I hope that he's got like a sock Justin set up in the chair beside him. <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, why? Why, why would you suggest this idea to the internet? Why? Why not? He's already got the set. He <laughs> just needs a sock Justin to no, set up his own. Yeah. Just no. Yeah. Be fine. No, he, he has to use the little paper craft one that was done by Caesar. No, no, <laughs> full size sock, Justin. <laughs> oh, that would be horrifying to mm. see. Please, nobody do this yeah. ever, ever, never do this. Ever do that, then send pictures. <laughs> you, you could win. Justin got a new yellow bag, blanket. You could win that. <laughs> oh, no, come on. I just got the thing. It was sent in from all the way down under. This one still folds. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> All right, before this descends into too much madness, we're going to take a very quick break for Warren Meets Matt. Thank you, dudes. Okay, I have something remarkable to show you today. This, without doubt, is the most optically three-dimensional mat I have seen to date. This is totally, totally freaking me out. 
So this is the wasteland, um, uh, the wasteland map from P Work um, War Games, and it, it's a it, it's a kind of like a blank canvas, desolate wasteland map. But I don't think I have ever seen a map, and I, I've been kind of like moving around and getting up and down to different levels. I don't think I've ever seen a map that has been more um, a kind of optically three-dimensional in in its texture it is it's extraordinary it is absolutely extraordinary and that's before i even get into the the details um uh and the tiny uh, little details and design elements in the mat just whenever you roll this thing out this is the six by four neoprene um it also comes in other sizes and uh, other materials like uh, pvc vinyl um cloth but it's the neoprene. It's the neoprene we want. That's hard wearing, nice weight, always rolls out flat. That's the that's the material of choice for any gamer these days. But the moment I rolled it out, I like I went, wow. Just w w whatever angle you come at it from, it just it <laughs> just seems to just kind of rise up out of the mat. It's it's really something else. It really is something else. Um, looking at the details, right. What can I say? It's a bunch of cracked earth. Um, uh, so details wise, it is just absolutely covered in detail. But at the same time, you know, there's, there's no outstanding detail in it that makes you feel like the mat is restricting you in any way. It's another one of those kind of must have mats for the collection. You know the type I'm talking about, you know, with your, you've got your really good kind of grass mat. So you always have something grass. You've got that kind of really good um, mat with the, with the stone effect for your kind of your cities and your dungeons and stuff. This is, this is your default kind of uh, wasteland mat. So 40K, Fallout, pretty much anything really. Um, uh, this map will just lend itself to that and I can see all sorts of um, sci-fi buildings and things like that just working on this. I think even for you guys playing Age of Sigmar that this is this is just stunningly good. It, it feels like the, like the kind of chaos wastelands. Um, for you guys on the, the Kings of War, you know those abyssals, you, you can imagine them um, uh, crawling out and going to war uh, across this. Certainly uh, for myself, I have um, some chaos guys uh, that we play with the Age of Saga Magic, and I think that they would just be incredible on this mat. I, I really do. Um, your terrain choices are kind of limitless because it's you could put almost anything on this. I'm, I'm tempted if you swing around over there. Woo! I'm tempted to grab some of that stuff and um, of the city stuff and, and put it on just uh, just to see uh, how it sits. Um, where do you start with the individual details? Love the intonation of the mat. Firstly, the color palette of the mat is beautiful. Um, it, lovely, warm colors. N feels really natural. We had to uh, take s uh, some mats recently and warm them up using uh, colored dyes and things like that. No such uh, requirement with a mat like this. It's lovely and natural, which means that you can make your scatter terrain, your rubble mixes and things like that, very easily match with that because the, the very stone gray kind of uh, the harsh, cold colored mats are actually quite difficult um, uh, for you to uh, work with terrain wise as a war gamer because most of the washes and things that we do tends to add a little bit of a brown pigment to it so um, using your washes and um, sprays and things like that on your terrain and on your rubble mix will fit in nicely with this mat really nice choice of color palette really nice choice of color palette Specific design details that I love is I, I really love the harsh shadows um, uh, that they've given behind some of these rocks. 
Um, this is what is giving um, that that three dimensional, almost like pop out of the mat effect. Um, is that they've went harsh with the shadows. It's a really nice optical trick. The resolution of the mat is very very good and able to pull that off. Um, so it's it really is it really is a heck of a mat, um, and certainly one that would go to the top of my list as mats to have uh, your core collection um, that you can uh, whip out and have real kind of flexibility of what you do on it. So yeah, that is the Wasteland mat by P-Works. Back to the guys. As we all know, Warren loves his mats. Mm -hmm. uh, P-Works, they're doing some really nice stuff these days. It's a really nice generic mat as well. It works for anything sort of dystopian or science fiction or even Wild West or Kursk or Tobruk. You can, you can fire a lot of stuff down on there. It'd be yeah. nice for Gaslands because Refueled is coming out in a couple yeah. of months. That could yeah. be fun. So I imagine yeah. a lot of people will be getting jumping back into Gaslands yeah. in a big way when it lands. As well as the uh, that mat that we just left up there, they actually put two mats up this week onto their web store, which are more centered around the idea of board games, card games, and, and role-playing games. So they've got one that's just plain black. Hmm. So it's pretty cool for just playing games and just having something that makes it, it, it a little easier to pick up cards off the table because we've all had that problem of trying to get things off the edge of the table and, and ruining the cards and all that kind of thing. And they've also, pardon me, they've also got one called the Old Inn, which is pretty cool for uh, role-playing games and things. So if you've seen the one that we've sometimes used for some of our board games and that kind of thing, it's a little bit like that in style. And it looks kind of cool. So very good for things like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. Speaking of things coming out, what's in the news this week, buddy? Cool. So uh, the first bit of news this week is for stuff that's coming out for pre-order today. Uh, so you should be able to go and check it out on store.ontabletop.com if you want to go and check it out for yourself. But there's some new stuff for Warcry, first off, from the guys at Games Workshop. So uh, we had the starter set coming out last weekend, which was pretty awesome, with the Iron Golems and the Untamed Beasts in it. But three new warbands have been added into the mix this weekend for you to go and pick out and try. So you've got the Unmade, who are that sort of very, very creepy, weird warband who have decided to honour the Chaos Gods by cutting their limbs off and replacing them with bits of spike and all kinds of things like that they look very very creepy indeed and i've seen some interesting conversions where people have done them with like them ripping off their faces and all kinds of weird stuff as well it's it's very terrifying as well as that you've got the corvus cabal who are the uh chaos warband who worship uh, a aspect of chaos that's a little bit like a predator scavenger god that takes the um, the sort of like icon of a, of a raven or a crow so you've got those guys who are going to be flying around and jumping around the map trying to kill everybody that way and then, of course, you've got the Splintered Fang, who are the guys that live, I think it's in the realm of life they exist. That might be where they are. But they have a really interesting sort of gladiatorial style to their um, design, which I think is really cool. It mixes in very, very nicely with the, the idea of the elves and dark elves and stuff. I thought it was really nice. There's even a dark elf in that warband, which I thought was pretty awesome. And uh, they also sort of specialize themselves into a little bit of poisoning. So they're all about stabbing you and then running away and hoping you bleed to death and you know, the poison takes hold of you before they have to worry about you too much. So very good for trying to take down those really slow, hulking iron golems that you might be playing with at the moment. Uh, as well as that, they've also put together a new terrain set. So this is the one that we looked at in a preview. I think it was maybe last week or the week before. And this is for the Shattered Storm Bolts. So if you don't particularly want to be playing all your games around the eight points and in those ruined sort of ravaged lands that we've got in the core box, you've got a new interesting style of one to go and delve into. And of course, as I said in the article as well, and I've said before on like Hobby Hangout and things, this is a really cool idea for terrain because, you know, if you're going to be trying to appease Archeon, then you need to go and find him some good gifts. And the Storm Vaults held all the magic, magics of the Age of uh, Sigmar and the Age of Chaos back in the day. So something interesting there to go and pilfer for your Warband, which would be very cool. So, yeah, it's really awesome to see what they're doing for Warcry. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see what they do with the new unannounced Warband as well that they're coming out soon. So, yeah, very awesome. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more from Gen Con this weekend on these guys. So. Oh, yeah, Gen Con's this weekend, isn't it? It is this weekend, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, out of them all, I, I quite like the, the third warband just because they look a little bit less chaos -y than the others. The slanesh looking blokes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I always prefer chaos to be like a bit more subversive if I'm playing it. I don't like just rocking out there, tentacles and spikes everywhere. I've painted enough of that crap over the years, so I like something that's just a little bit more heroic chaos. Yeah. That's the interesting thing actually about the Splintered Fang and in particular the Scyther Lords which came out last week as well is that they've they've gone for an aspect of chaos that isn't necessarily just outwardly chaotic 
they could be seen by pretty much anybody else as, oh, maybe they just dress a slightly strange way because, for example, the Grand Alliance of Order has loads of different facets to it. I mean, Dark Elves and all kinds of things like the the Daughters of Cain, all those people are part of that and they could look inherently evil. So it's interesting uh, sort of seeing what they're doing with Chaos here and seeing some different sides to it. So Yeah. yeah. You see, I there was a novel I read years ago, uh, Rhapsody by Elizabeth Hayden, and there was a great line from it was... Uh, you know, do you think evil priests rock about cursing and killing people? <laughs> you know, no, they do the exact same thing as normal priests. It's just the coin you're paying in is different. Cursing and killing yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, weird. Years ago, I made a set of Chaos Marauders yeah? uh, with mm -hmm. additional hand weapons that use the first generation of witch elves. Sorry, witch. Oh. The, the dark Eldar. Which is yeah. mm. uh, oh, yeah. so so they came with tridents and nets and that sort of thing and I cut all the elf heads off and stuck on the Parazzo's Lost Legion because oh, okay, they had that cool. scalloped helm to make them look like yeah. gladiators and went there you go there's my additional hand weapon so it's nice to see GW catching me up twenty years down the line <laughs> <laughs> good see trend you, setting you, again I'm going to say trend setting yeah. again Joe. Yeah, to do. the mastermind behind the entire wargaming industry sitting right here mm. to my right <laughs> see I did that I did that first. This one, him at the front. That was me. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> All right, uh, then let's let's move off before Jerry really pulls the pin and goes off on one here. What's next in the news? Cool. So uh, coming up next, we've got some stuff for those people that want to get stuck into some Necromunda, and this is a set of the Palanite Enforcers for use in the game. So obviously up until this point, we've seen a lot of gangs that are all your typical gangs that you would have seen from Necromunda, as well as a lot of the characters and stuff like that. Um, so it's all just gangs doing crime and all that kind of thing as well. However, this is the Palanite Enforcers, which are, for want of a better word, the police of the 41st millennium, rocking around, given powers by their planetary governors, cracking skulls and all kinds of things like that. I'm probably doing a lot of evil things anyway because this is the 41st millennium. Uh, but they look very different, which is very, really interesting. And hopefully they'll come up with some really cool scenarios and stuff playing these guys on the tabletop. So it'll be a really nice sort of like uh, alternative to what you've seen with the gangs already. The other thing that comes with this as well is that there's going to be a new book. And that book itself uh, will contain new rules, obviously, for these Palanite Enforcers, but it will have some cool stuff for your gangs to do sort of like criminal rackets and things. So if you want to be doing some sort of dirty dealings behind the scenes and sort of like that little bit sort of like role-playing sort of uh, squad-building aspect of the game as well, then you've got some really cool stuff in there as well. So there's something for you, even if you don't want to play as the Enforcers. An interesting point that I wanted to bring up as well is that these are not Arbites, which I found out today by looking on Wiki of all places, which is pretty cool, but Arbites enforce the Lex Imperialis whereas the enforcers are just the police. So there you go. I don't know what the Lex Imperialis is, but I'm sure someone will tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. All of them. It'll, it'll already be a couple of paragraphs deep down there in the blue line <laughs> comments. Uh, now you, you see, the design of these, I'm having a, a yes, but no, but yes, but no, but yeah, they're kind of pretty kind of moment because they're a bit too sci-fi and not enough grimdark, if that makes I, sense. I think it might just be because the paint scheme was a little bit clean and the choice of yellow perhaps i think if it was done with a sort of dirtier paint scheme and maybe red or something as the sort of accent color i think you'd maybe see a little bit more of that grim dark thing going in yeah. also the fact that they're all just helmeted i think also sort of plays yeah. around with it a little bit well, but well, like, it is it is a uniform i guess yeah, yeah but the, the helmets are very reminiscent of the the primaris helmet which i think isn't really helping they're, they're incredibly reminiscent of mark IV maximus armor in fact yeah. i'll go one step further Somebody was flicking through one of the old white dwarves and seen Max, Mark IV Maximus armor and went, we've not done anything with that in years. We're having that. <laughs> Even down to the um, respirator slits at the front. Uh, so just If you're sitting at home, open a tab, folks, and just Google that. Mark IV Maximus. Uh, it, it's, you, it's identical. Are you saying this is like a Big Brother situation where they've gone, hey, you can have my hand-me-down armor from back when I was younger? Yeah, why not? <laughs> they would look really nice painted up like... Um, Judges from Dread, so yeah. green, uh, red green, and black. Yeah, well, green, blue, and black with a bit of red in the helmets. Yeah, because you've even got the same style knee pads and, and boots. Those big chunky leather boots. Yeah, I like yeah. them. And as for a lot of people that are saying that they, you know, would like to see Arbites coming up, I'm fairly sure that 
uh, Gator Rush are going to do that. Uh, I mean, if they're bringing out these enforcers, that's a really interesting sort of like angle for them mm-hmm. to go down. And maybe they'll do something with the special character range that they've been doing with Forge World, and maybe bring out some Arbites or some main characters for you to throw in there alongside these guys, perhaps. But, yeah, yeah cool. maybe. Well, I mean, like it's it's nice to see there are more factions coming for Necromunda because it's it's been a little while since we've seen anything really major come out for it. So I'm quite content with this. Want rat skins? You rat, more rat, rat, rat skins. skins? Okay, rat skin rat. nation. I, explain rat. rat skins just for everybody at home. All right, uh, in Necromunda, there are feral native people called ratskins uh-huh. who live in the very belly of the Underhive and hunt the giant rats, wear them like pelts, like hats, okay. like cloaks. They run about with muskets and axes made from whatever scrap pipe they can lay their hands on. <laughs> right. But your ratskin nation, you know, you don't look at eight people in a Necromunda gang. What's the point of that when I can have 30 terrible little <laughs> ratskins swarming over you going, oh, you've got a shotgun, have you? How many barrels is that? Oh, it's only got one barrel. You're only shooting one or two people a term. I oh, yeah. think you'll find I've got more than you. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're really, if you're really good, Brakar, he who reigns points, will set up top of the heavy stubber. It's a special rat skin character. He was gorgeous. We love him. Bring rat, rat skins. I want them now. No <laughs> rat skins. We'll really cool see them come back. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is one of the reasons I love Necromunda as a setting for the 40k universe because it's a part of the 40k world you don't really get whenever you're reading Black Library novels and stuff. I know there's one or two that actually deal with Necromunda, but they're quite old now. Yeah, there are, there's there's an awful lot. Even even if they're not adding new things in like these guys, um, there's still some spectacularly good uh, Necromunda gangs from the original release that mm. could do with an upgrade. The Spirers, for example, mm. who are all just rich kids yeah. with the most expensive armor they can find who just go off into the hive and just kill civilians because... Why it's not? so much fun. And if somebody catches you, daddy will pay to you know, yeah, yeah. make that all go away. So it's fine. Yeah. So we're all fine here. Uh, I had one moment of absolute joy and then abject sadness recently. Our local secondhand bookstore actually got in an original copy of Necromunda. Nice. Put up a post on Facebook. I was in there straight away going, can you hold this for me till next month? I want it. It was just like, oh, sorry. It's only got the cardboard inside. It doesn't have the books. It doesn't have the minis. And I'm just like, oh, Shame. crap. <laughs> so oh. sad. Want that. It does. <laughs> but yeah, definitely nice to see they're doing more for it and nice to see they're exploring the world more. Right. <laughs> Next up, Mythic Games has a bit of news. Ben. Yeah, sure. So uh, Mythic Games, so you'll know them do a whole bunch of stuff. So Solomon Kane and, uh, and all those other kind of games like that, as well as uh, Joan of Arc Time of Legends, or Time of Legends, Joan of Arc, whichever way around that goes. But anyway, they're working with Lucky Duck Games on a new game set within the world of Joan of Arc called Time of Legends Destinies. So this is going to be a new collaborative one to three player adventure style game driven by an app narrative that will sort of take you through choices and consequences and action and combat and all kinds of things like that. We don't know too much about the game beyond that right now, other than that it's being done alongside Lucky Duck, as I said before, who have done some stuff before with app integration for a game called Chronicles of Crime. So this was a game that had a very strong narrative focus once again, and the whole idea of that was that you could use the app to scan certain cards and then you'd find out information about them. And they're going to be using that same scan and play technology in this game as well to uncover information as you go through the game, so it's really cool. Now, this being Mythic Games, I would assume that we're going to see some very cool miniatures in it, and also, obviously, the app content and all that kind of thing as well. So it'll be a really nice melding of the two. Hopefully, we've heard a little bit more about it over the weekend from Gen Con, and we can bring you a little bit more details about it as well. And I'm sure the Mythic Games will talk to us about it in due course as well and come over and have a look at it as well. But this sounds very, very cool. A really interesting use of the Time of Legends uh, sort of IP and stuff like that in the world. So it'll be very nice to see what they do with this one going forward. Yeah. yeah. This, this one has me curious because if they ever want to expand this and do add-ons to this game, Obviously, you'll have additional stuff added to the app mm. and then maybe some extra cards added in if it has that, that scan mm. and play technology. I just mm. wonder how they could maybe fold that in to actually increase the, the variation within the storylines as well. Yeah, so I think it, if it's anything like what they've done in the past from FFG, for example, maybe they'll do something where all the expansions and additional content that you can get is sort of folded into the app and you sort of dot exactly what you've got and etc. like that. Mm-hmm. And then it randomly sorts through all that and puts it into your encounters and things going forward. So maybe it's going to be something like that or maybe it'll be a little bit more of a core box style experience that'll just be contained to exactly what's in that main set for Time of Legends Destinies. But I'm looking forward to it. App integration is becoming a lot more of a big thing. We looked at Tibura last week as well from Simon, so we'll see where it goes. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's nice to see the technology, although I'm sure Jerry's sitting there going, no, no, what's, what's this? I need, I need some <laughs> form of tech device. I want pen and paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do like seeing the peasants running on fire away from the burning city, though. Well, what it appears nice. to be some sort of cthulhu creature and yeah. its big burning friend is laying waste to the place. So. Yeah, well, you know, good time in the cabin. You've got all the tentacles in the background there, just in the shadows. Yeah, like, really, you reach that, out and grab that's somebody. Cthulhu, that's the Cthulhu-esque creature. Oh, right. right. Sorry, I thought you meant the thing in the front. No, no. All right, what's next, Ben? Uh, so next up, we've got some news from Modifius that they announced at QuakeCon last weekend, and that is that they're going to be bringing an absolutely insanely huge miniature to the world of Fallout Waste and Warfare. So for anyone that has played Fallout, you'll probably know what Liberty Prime is. Liberty Prime is now coming to the tabletop in miniature form. This is 234 millimeters in height, and it's absolutely massive, and comes in about five resin parts, and I have no idea how, do you, how you'd use this in-game, because it is just a nuclear bomb machine. So it'd be very cool to see how this one is used, but it looks pretty amazing. A lot of people who love the world have already gone out and pre-ordered it ahead of its release later on this year. So yeah, very, very cool. So if you like the world of uh, Fallout, you've got something there to look at, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, hold up. That's a 28mm mini. Yep. It, yes. As I said, it's massive. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we thought the, the super mutant behemoth there was big wow yeah that is uh, ridiculous in terms of sort of gameplay and things like that a lot of people have already postulated that maybe you do something with your various gangs and stuff within the world of fallout and you can find bits of, of the liberty prime sort of scattered around the landscape and if you can collect all five parts you can put it together build your own liberty prime and set it going to throw nuclear bombs at all your enemies so yeah, that could be kind of cool. <laughs> See, I kind of imagine this like the giant hunting scenario where you're actually trying to take down Liberty Prime whenever it's gone on a rampage. Yeah. Could be a yeah, very cool be one cool. because Good. then yeah. you could have multiple factions playing on the tabletop and it running off the AI system that's built into the game. Yeah, that'd be really good. Yeah. Just send somebody don't like to go and shoot the nuke in a hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fallout uh, 4 did have the, the bomber super mutants that you kind of had to do that to. Yeah, well, he's a prime example right there. Look, it's right <laughs> in his hand. Its yeah. nose is facing you. You could just go pew, pew, pew. Pip that. Pip that. Just get, yeah. get the warhead. Yeah. Push. <laughs> Job done. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. all I lost was 30 ratskins. It's fine. <laughs> I'll find uh, you. You're crossing the streams there, Jerry. Crossing know, the Grant. streams. It's Grant. I'm pretty sure there's bound to be some sort of ratskin like super mutant thing. Uh, well, you have the mole people in the new one. There you go. See? Yeah, mole miners. Do they wear mole skins on their head that, from giant mutant moles well, that they've killed? Well, you kind of, they're big, like, hunched mining guys. They're always running around with shotguns and they piss me off no end. Good enough. Skin some moles and you're, you're sorted. Yeah. Great. All right. <laughs> next up, Ben. Uh, so next up, we have some stuff for those people that want to get stuck into Bolt Action Career from the guys at uh, Warlord Games. And this is that they put forward two new options for those who want to try and build up armies for either side of the conflict. So we've got uh, two options here. The first of these for the British Commonwealth. We get themselves a couple of uh, units of infantry uh, uh, and then two vehicles there as well. So you've got the big uh, Centurion Mark III there. And on the other side, you've got the Chinese People's Volunteer Army, which is made up of conscripts and all kinds of volunteers in there as well. So again, another core of infantry plus two vehicles there with the tank being the M3 Stewart. Um, so yeah, if you're diving into a little bit of a bolt action career, you've got two more options there. If you don't want to play as the US and uh, the Koreans themselves, you've got some really cool stuff there too. So yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Liking the models very much. It'll be cool to see exactly where this sort of develops going forward with the narrative and that kind of thing, and what other armies are throwing to the fray, because there were a lot of other countries involved in the conflict, as we've talked about mm. on previous weekenders and XLBSs. So. Mm -hmm. Now, Jerry, I have a question. Yes. So there's probably a stupid question, but the time Tank on the Chinese People's Volunteer Army. Yes. Is that a Stuart or a ripoff of a Stuart? It's a Stuart. Okay. And, and this I was is... just sitting there wondering how the hell did they get a Stuart? Because <clears throat> the, the Americans give it to them. Okay. Uh, uh, during World War II, uh, which is only like finished yeah, five yeah, yeah. years previously, yeah, I get that. they were fighting the Japanese, so they were supplied by the US. Ah, uh, okay. And then supplied by the Soviets yeah. afterwards, so you can have a really interesting mix of vehicles and weapons with yeah. the uh, the Chinese. Okay, you see that's that's one part of World War Two that I never really hear a lot about Pacific. is that that Chinese front. It's uh, it's because of where we situated geographically. Yeah, people go oh, World War Two, Europe yeah, centric. For, yeah, if you spin around the other side uh. to um, Australia and America, yeah, they're much more focused on the the fronts that they're. Yeah, they were fighting in. Yeah, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's one that it's gets glossed like over to dig here. Into a little bit more. It's vicious. Yeah, I'll give you that. Manchuria yeah. was not a fun place to be. Yeah, um, but yeah, so the I think the 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 PVA, not named after the glue, 
Um, are, are they not CPVA? No, no, just PVA. Uh, would be an interesting faction simply because you've got that mix of mm -hmm. um, equipment available to them. Yeah. Uh, and then likewise for the British, the British are, um, well, they've got the new chunky stuff, but even that, that there's still, that's um, an American M3 that they're rocking in there yeah, the as far as their half track goes. So they've also got American bits and pieces. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to play very early British, mm. you can still use your um, World War Two bolt mm -hmm. action British because so they, like you can roll in some Churchills and stuff. Yeah. Plus, well, plus the infantry as well, because yeah. they didn't swap over until they'd been through the first winter when they realized that the uniform was just not fit for purpose at all. Yeah. Um, so you could use any of the sort of Burma campaign stuff for your summer tropical and then use actually use the, the Western front. Yeah. Um, so you use your Normandy Europe uh, mm -hmm. outfits for winter because they give it to them and then they went, oh, this doesn't work particularly well. We're all freezing. Yeah. That's interesting. I'll give you that. Mm. All right, uh, moving along, there's Germans and Ukrainians coming as well, Dan. Uh, so, yeah, these are from the guys at Strategies Heroes. Uh, once again, they've made sure that I have had my eyes opened to stories from World War II, which is pretty awesome indeed. So we've got two heroes here, one from Germany, one from Ukraine, seven for the Soviets, of course. The first of these is Fritz Klinkenberg, who I didn't know anything about until I started reading about this guy during the week. But he was a pretty interesting hero of the war for the Germans. He was... Uh, responsible effectively for the capture of Yugoslavia's capital basically by himself and about a handful of men. Um, he was an officer who was serving in the Waffen SS and he was heading to the capital and he was very, very eager to take it. And he couldn't get across the bridge because he didn't want to get in because everything was either blown up or it had been sort of defended and all that kind of thing. So he took a bunch of his men across the river and stuck into the city where he was able to, where he was then, you know, set upon by a handful of soldiers. But without firing a shot, he was able to make sure that every single one of them surrendered to him. Then a vehicle column turned up and he managed to get them to surrender, turning his group of men into effectively a mechanized unit, which he then rolled up to the Yugoslavian war ministry, which was entirely empty because it had been bombed earlier in the campaign, and basically decided he'd taken it over. He then walked over to the German embassy, which was still open in the country, and basically had the, the flag of uh, the Nazi of the Nazi regime draped over the side of it, claiming that he'd taken the city. And then soon enough, the um, I think it was the uh, I can't remember his name now. What was it? Is the mayor? The mayor came over to him and was like, "Hey, you know what? You've taken the city. Have it." And for that, he got given many, many awards, uh, which is pretty interesting. He got the, uh, the Knight's Cross of the Iron's Cross for doing that, which I thought was pretty interesting. On the other side of things, we've got a Soviet hero by the name of uh, Ivan Pavlovich, and he was a cook in his unit. And one day, uh, all the rest of his men were out on patrol, and he was the only one left in camp, and a massive tank rolled up. And he, the first thing he thought was, oh, great, I've got more men to feed, I don't have enough food, until he turned around and realized it was a German panzer. So he promptly jumped behind his tent and hid there with his axe and his rifle. And as the Germans got out of the tank and started having a search around, he leapt from behind the tent with his axe and his gun, firing it wildly, shouting at the top of his voice, and chased the Germans back, the German crew, back into their tank. He clambered on top of it, and just as they were about to start firing, he hammered their machine gun with his axe, breaking the barrel so he couldn't fire anymore. And as they tried to retreat, he then stuffed all the peepholes with cloth so they couldn't see what they were doing and crashed the tank into a tree. <laughs> he then convinced the Germans to climb out because he, they thought there were loads of them around and he called for people to bring their tank grenades to try and take them out. And he made them all tie each other up one by one. So therefore, he got the entire tank crew to uh, surrender when his unit returned and they were all very, very surprised. This then meant that he was promoted to a scout it then went a little bit further uh, when he was able to, um, uh, when he was going off in, on more wild exploits later on. He was off on patrol doing his scouting when he saw a German tank and a whole bunch of German soldiers chasing some Soviets through a village. So he, <laughs> he ran up on top of the tank, pulled the, the hatch open, threw a grenade in, killed the crew inside, jumped inside the tank and fired the main cannon killing a whole bunch of German soldiers and causing the rest of them to surrender when they realized what was happening, which meant that he was then promoted once again, which I thought was pretty fascinating. So that's a very potted version of the, the stories there, and I'm sure there's a little, lots of more in-depth stuff on the internet. But once again, an amazing look at two crazy characters that are a little bit you know, larger than life from the guys at uh, Stoic's Heroes, but go check out.
So yeah. <laughs> well, the 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 stories you get from history are sometimes crazier than any fiction you will ever read. Very much so. Uh, and, I'll, yeah. It's impressive what you have to do to get out of peeling potatoes for the Soviets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, I, I have to say, whenever he drops a grenade into a tank, he's kind of lucky he didn't touch off the ammo. Mm, you know. Exactly. It was a clearly a, a precisely dropped grenade. He, he knew exactly what he was doing. No, well, no, he, like, he was probably just in a vodka fueled rage. Maybe. <laughs> Either way, it worked. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think yourself, Jerry? I'd have been looking for more than just the Knight's Cross, Iron Cross, right. for, for taking an entire city yeah. with, with a handful of men. I've been demanding oak leaves on that one. <laughs> well, I mean, like, if you rock up and you're fit to BS your way through it, you know, you can do some crazy stuff. Yeah, they're beautiful sculpts as well. They are, they they're... are. I mean, like, the guys at Stoessies, they, they do all the research necessary mm. to get it actually precise, which is good. Yeah, they're, they're great companions for anyone who's actually building up bolt action armies or chain command armies. Uh -huh. Where I'll drop a couple of these characters in and play through their interesting scenarios yourself, uh -huh. maybe with the game master in a cooperative sense or something. Hmm. That'd be a really cool idea. So, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right. It is time for another break because Warren is going to be taking us through a look at d the new Dungeons and Lasers terrain. Twice in one episode? I don't know who's luckier, me or you. Okay, so as you'll know, We've been building up to the 40k weekend and we've been using this terrain from um, Archon's Rampart um, uh, Kickstarter. Um, it has been fabulous. I'm super, super in love with this stuff. Uh, just what it's allowed us to, to create has been absolutely um, extraordinary. Uh, it's flexible, it's really, really strong, and it just goes together so nice. However, we got a demo kit through for... Are you all joining me? Perfect timing. Right, we got a demo kit through, Justin. Yes. For Dungeons a, and for Lasers. Dungeons and Lasers. So what this is, this is a dual modular sci-fi... Uh, dual modular kind of dungeon crawling set. Well, it does okay. three types of terrain mm -hmm. from the Kickstarter. So you've got your high sci-fi set. Yeah. You've got your alien nest sort of set. Yeah. And you've got your fantasy dungeon set. Right. So, what we got was a demo box. Yes. Okay. And in the demo box, you get a handful of sprues. Yes. Now, let me point something out about the demo kit. The demo kit has both sci-fi and fantasy uh, back to back. The, the, end, the end product uh, won't be like that. Um, and as a demo kit, I kind of understand what they're trying to do, but it, it's uh, it, it confused me a little bit whenever I, uh, I first saw it. So yeah, each side will be fantasy or sci-fi. So don't be worrying uh, about that. But again, good, robust plastic. Mm -hmm. Really nice, robust, hard plastic. Goes together perfectly uh, with your plastic cements and things like that there. Mm -hmm. However... You don't even need it. You don't need plastic glue whatsoever. Justin, join me, my friend. All right, I, you've got a bunch of flips. I flipped a few. <laughs> There's also a little dog. Uh, let yeah. me show you what's in the set. So uh, in the set, you get the, the different kinds of uh, sprue back and front. There's a little dog in there. I didn't he's bother. He's got to... a sword in his mouth. Yeah, he's cute. I didn't bother to build him because all I really care about is the, is the terrain itself. Yeah. I just really wanted to see it. So all right. this is, uh, these are your terrain elements here, okay? And it's a modular system to allow you to rapidly uh, build up uh, dungeon uh, uh, dungeon crawling environments. So all you have to do, if you look here, is just clip that together like that. And bam, Bob is your uncle. Now don't forget Warren, you also get the extension components for your floors. Mm -hmm. So you can just, and you're not pulling that apart. Yeah, that's using these little jobbies here. Mm -hmm. So if you grab those, pop one there, let me grab another one, pop that one there, and then Let's do that. Done. Absolutely rock hard. Mm -hmm. And then you have these other little single walls, um, which go clip in nicely like that. Mm -hmm. And like that. Let me put another double wall on, just into here. And another single, let me put a door on this time. 
Okay, and then one more single wall. Actually, let's let's be a bit let's 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 be even crazier than that. Um, I'm pretty sure we could pop another one of these on here, then pop that in like that, and then put some wall segments in into the likes of this bit. Mm -hmm. And if you've already made some bits, you can start linking them on, Warren. Yeah. Hang on, if you want to put this on there. So that would then go into there, like that. Yeah. Look at this! You can very, very quickly start to, to lay out some intricate dungeons for your, your role-playing group, your dungeon crawl party. And that's all from one sprue. Mm. Okay, so um, I'm expecting, as a result of the Kickstarter, lots of other interesting, flexible pieces that allow you to put uh, your dungeons together rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So, we took this and we, we thought to ourselves, well, we're interested to see um, what, what it looks like and what it looks like painted. Yes. Um, but rather than put this into the hands of any of the experienced painters, yeah. we decided to do a challenge and put it into the hands of the worst painter. Oh, God. The, the, the person who likes painting the absolute least. Why are the you giving this to John? The retired <laughs> painter, someone who gave up painting. Um, uh, just to see. And that was me. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I will give that a go. Because this is exactly the kind of thing that I would like to have um, in my family. Mm -hmm. um, so I can rattle out dungeons. I, I love doing dungeon crawling and stuff like that with yeah. my kids. So I thought to myself, well look, the, let's to put this to a true proper test, let's see how it can look in the hands of someone that doesn't paint. In fact, you know what I would use this for? See if you pre-built a few of these, you could do Escape the Dark Castle with this. You could. So, this is my amateurish, um, but simple, end result. So once again, no glue holding any of this together. Uh, my painting process was super simple. I primed it black. Now I've left the outsides black because I'm not concerned with the outsides. I just want to see what the insides of the, the actual dungeon itself uh, looks like. So I primed it black. I then gave it a dusting from a zenith angle mm -hmm. with a, uh, so it was army painter black, it was primed, primed with solid. Mm -hmm. Then a dusting of army painter uniform gray. Yeah. I then um, let that all dry and then gave the whole thing a complete dry brush with a uh, brain matter beige. Ah. And I used a makeup brush. Yeah, they're coming in pretty handy, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, I, I thought I'm gonna I'll do something a little bit different. So I used a makeup brush to give the whole thing a complete paint of be uh, brain matter beige. And then all the wood is just a wash over the top of it. It's just a soft tone uh -huh. wash over the top of uh, everything that was dry brushed and it, it brought out this beautiful pale wood effect. And then how did you get this this nice uh, ready effect? So that nice red effect is a uh, kind of like a um, an old iron kind of a paint from the Army Painter range uh -huh. and then Nuln Oil. Okay, and I'm seeing you've done what looks to be a little bit of silver A little bit here. of, just a little bit of like a plate mail and a Nuln Oil over the stone and the plate mail. So, it, so really, it's just a handful of items, and and that was that was it. That was all that it took. Right. No, worry. And then that question. leaves me. No, just to, uh, uh, from the perspective of how I approach dungeons, and um, so that would go like that, and then that goes like that. So this is my dungeon. Whenever I'm building dungeons, I tend to leave corridors with the sides open. Yeah, for people okay. to reach in. Just to, just for uh, simplicity's sake, for uh, reaching in, and then I, I, I use the extra pieces for closing off kind of rooms, so that rooms look like rooms and corridors are, are slightly open. But there's no reason why you couldn't double up your corridors or put your walls um, into your corridors if you so felt like it. I just like to, to do it this way, so it's more kind of yeah. two point five dimensional. Yeah. You know, so it's. But I love it, Justin. I, I, I'm really excited to even show this to my children mm -hmm. and say to them, look, I have a bunch more. I started this from a standing start. So all I had was some bits. Yeah. I came in at 6 a.m. <laughs> and by 9 a.m. I had reached that stage. That's not bad, three hours work. So three hours, put it together, primed it and painted it. 
um, uh, to the point where I, I was happy to, to say, job done. And I would, I would be very happy to host anyone uh, to play a dungeon crawler with me on terrain like that. All right, well, that's lovely. I'll let you get back to what you were doing, and I'll get back to the boys. I might put some more of this together. The guys from Archon are going absolutely crazy with their plastic terrains at the minute. Those are looking really good. I'm a big fan of them. I quite like the um, alien, the Geiger-esque alien walls. Yeah. I was talking with Warren about this. Color flip paint applied to those. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To, to make it look with like that oily, greasy, black, purple sheen. Yeah. Just like the alien itself would look fantastic. Even yeah. things like the standard um, stone dungeon. Yeah. It was really nice. See, I quite like the, the sci-fi variant they have at the front here because I imagine that being done like very bright, very clean sort of 2001 Space Odyssey style. Yeah. Yeah, or you could grime it up easily enough and use it for Necro or use it for... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Dead Zone. Dead Zone. Yeah, yeah, Dead Zone's the one. Mm. Well, I mean, like, the possibilities are endless for mm. this kind of terrain because it's, it's a full modular set that you can just do as you please with. Yep, chuck it in everywhere. Yeah. All right, Ben, time for Kickstarter. What have you picked this yeah. week? So we've got uh, two that are very much focused around the idea of 3D printing at home and one that is all focused around one particular miniature, which I thought was really interesting. So the first one is from the guys at War Layer, and this is for their 3D printable terrain. So this is a new set of modular 3D printable terrain, a little bit like what we just saw there with Dungeons and Lasers, that he's able to slot together using a really interesting system, using pillars and sort of the different um, sort of uh, like panel bits effectively. Each of those little individual components is printed separately, which makes it a little bit easier to do at home, which is pretty cool, rather than just having to paint, print an entirely huge structure, which thought it's really cool. And it also requires no additional clips and all that kind of thing as well. So it all just goes together with that slotting mechanic, which I thought was really quite fun. Mm. The interesting thing they said about this is that this is modular as frig, although they didn't use the word frig, and it can be put together in a whole bunch of different ways to create interesting battlefields for your grim dark futures, maybe something like Dead Zone, as we were talking about before, for Necromancer and that kind of thing too. Mm. They've done some really cool stuff where, as well as just the buildings, they've also created some sort of uh, board text bits as well so you know like a little bit what we're doing for the big apocalypse table we've got those like realm of a uh, city of death boards or realm of battle boards whatever they're called we're using something like that in their kind of kickstarter so it's really fun as well they've also got some additional options in the web because war there have been going for quite a while so they've got some really cool stuff in there for um uh, fantasy terrain and of course to make lloyd happy there's a big ass sci-fi train because who doesn't like trains so it was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there a big ass shot of the big ass of the? Ass there should be a big ass train shot down the uh, big ass. Well, page. Right. <laughs> See the the real key for me with this kind of terrain set is making sure that they're supporting people and giving them sort of a rough idea of what sentence they should be running on their three D printers because the three D printers are a hobby in and of themselves. So I mean, like recently we've had a guest in who has actually taught me a hell of a lot about running our three D printers and actually just some of the more advanced settings. But whenever you jump into a Kickstarter like this, if you are an experienced 3D printer, not a problem. If you're a new novice, I really want to see companies start to actually just give the beginner's guide to our terrain set. Now they have put together a little bit of a video further towards the bottom of the page where they talk about how to print and paint war layer models. So go and check that out if you want to get a little bit of a sort of insight into that. And of course, we've been doing loads of stuff with 3D printing. So hopefully we'll have something in the future where we can tell you a little bit of the tips and tricks. Mm. We have been doing that a little bit in uh, backstage and the hobby vlogs and that kind of thing as well where you've been showing off how using the programs and things Justin but uh, yeah very very cool yeah. really nice to see some more stuff that is 3D printable which is good so it's got a really low buy in as you might imagine and then it's yeah. just print it, print as many as you want so yeah well that's that's the greatest thing about these is once you have those STL files your your model count is limitless oh I like the cargo containers they are yeah. perfect for set on terrain mm -hmm. and the terrain looks right. good too Choo -choo. Oh, they've got some fancy <laughs> stuff in here as well, Ben. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I was saying they've got some fancy options mm -hmm. in there if you want to do some add-ons and all kinds of bits and pieces like that. So, Right, next Kickstarter, Ben. Uh, so next up, we've got uh, the War Across Europe 3D printable files from the guys at WoW Buildings. And this is one that uh, Lloyd pointed me towards because... As we'll get to later, there are trains involved, so of course you went to there. <laughs> but uh, this is a set of 3D printable files that you can print off at home, a little bit like the last Kickstarter we looked at, but allows you to build all of World War II Europe, all the way from Normandy up into Stalingrad, 
and into the Soviet realms as well. Uh, so they've got things for Town, they've got stuff for Stalingrad, as I've just mentioned. They've got ways for you to build Brecon Manor if you want to do that. They've got the defences at Juno Beach, which is really cool, all of them in high detail. There's bombed out warehouses, there's factories, there's buildings that you would have seen in the rural settings as well, which I thought was really good. Additionally, one of the things I talked about with this campaign is that they originally designed them to be in 28 mil, but they've also designed it so that you can scale them down to 6 mil as well, and they still hold a lot of their details, which I thought was really good. So if you want to be playing very, very, very time scale, then you've got some really awesome options there as well. But if you like the idea of delving into World War II and some 3D printing terrain, maybe you're going to be playing a lot of stuff in Flames of War, for example, with the new edition and everything that's happening there with the grand campaign coming up later in the year from us and the guys at Battlefront, this would be some really awesome stuff to go and pick up for yourself and try out a little bit of 3D printing, maybe in a little smaller scale. Yeah, yeah there's one thing this Kickstarter is doing that I love more than anything else. They're giving you a free test file, so you can actually yes. actually get a print out before you decide to pledge, and you can look at the, the design quality, the STL quality, and actually see for yourself, is this something that I really like the design of? That takes a bit of courage for a company. And, and the, the little test thing there, sorry, Jerry, is actually looking okay. really finely detailed. I, think yep. that was really... I was impressed by the fact that they're giving people the option to buy it as a license. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can sell them. Ah, that's yeah. clever. It's very cool, yeah. It sort of opens up the sort of idea that they're supplying the ideas and then you can just use it as the sort of basis of something going forward. I thought it was really cool. So maybe a lot of people will pick this up and start selling them on Etsy and eBay and things. That'd be pretty good. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. but even if you're going to like a, a local convention, if you have a 3D printer that you're just cycling out a bunch of these before a convention, you turn up to it, sell them, and that's your beer money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I suppose so. That's true. What, true. best use for a 3D printer? Make me beer money. <laughs> That's one way of doing I, think, it, I, think, I think it's illegal to print money, uh, Justin. Just so you're aware. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. So, ben, you're, you're misunderstanding the commerce here. I print I, I, the I, tiny I, fighting men's building. I sell the tiny fighting men's building. I then get money for the tiny fighting men's building. I then get beer. Tell me yeah, more about okay. your plan uh, for printing money, I, though. I like that. I, I understood that. that. <laughs> oh, there's the tractor factory. Oh, very cool. Yeah, there's some really fascinating little uh, sort of images here and renders that you get stuck into showing off what they're all doing. As, they, as I said, they've got a lot of really good stuff in that's got really nice detail levels to it, and a lot of their sort of interior structures have got lots of detail built into it as well. So it looks like a really interesting one. There's like there's an, like an entire dockyard as well. Yeah, yeah. doing something in that sort of uh, San Mazir sort of style. We've got something there too. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. I wonder what stretch goal they need to head for the Reichstag. Oh, you want the Reichstag? <laughs> I'd love to see it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you love me to print it for you? It would be about six foot long and 15 mil. I could do that. Because <laughs> I've seen a company selling them before. Oh, right. But yeah, their, their stuff is lovely. Yeah. Oh, nice. They did Pegasus Bridge. Yeah, they've yeah. done it. Uh, and it if, looks if you like can, it functions. If you can name something that's famous for having a fight round it, they've got it in here at the moment, <laughs> more see. or less. That's, I see. That's why I'm hoping for the Reichstag, because they are doing, it's like three sets. Yeah. Berlin. Uh, Russia and then sort of Normandy. Yeah. So I'm assuming Berlin. at some point we'll see something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There well, is a ton to see here. There's no paratrooper on this though. Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shame. Yeah. Maybe he's not on. Maybe it's a stretch goal. But you get a possibly. tiny paratrooper. You can hang yeah. off the tower of some <laughs> place there. Now, are you going to paint it that he got shot in the legs? No. 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 Okay. So tons and tons of stuff. They've been firing them out at rate of knots. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I'll give you something to do then. Uh, Over the weekend. <laughs> there. This is the first mistake everybody makes about 3D printing. It is not fast. It's, I'm not making a mistake. I'm just be, telling you, you can do it over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a weekend, fine. You get me 10 3D printers, I can maybe do it. You've got 3D printers here. <laughs> yeah, but I said get me 10. Why? So that I can run multiples at the same time. It's one, one, one with you. Let's make do with what you have. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a very cool Kickstarter. I, I mm. like what they're doing there, and I like the variety of stuff you can lay your hands on in that one. Any mm. Reichstag, Jerry? No Reichstag? No Reichstag, yet. Oh. That's why I'm wondering what they, because I've already been through it. That's why I'm wondering what they have to hit stretch goal right wise, because it must be in there. Okay. Maybe at 15,000. Uh, that type of thing. All right. Uh, final Kickstarter then, Ben. 
Yeah, so the final one is a sort of quick one that's got only got a handful of days left in order to get involved with this. And this is from Salt Forge Miniatures, and this is a sculptor who has been working for 10 years in the industry and knows his stuff when it comes to sculpting and that kind of thing as well. But this is just a uh, Kickstarter based around the idea of funding one model. And this model is the absolutely insanely awesome looking great demon sulfurious that you can see there which is 250 millimeters in height from base to tip perfect for something like leading a chaos army in whichever game you would prefer to play him in but there's so much detail built into this model looks absolutely insane love what you've been doing with it reminds me of a lot of the stuff you would have seen in games like diablo for example and uh, yeah a really stunning looking sculpt that uh, i believe if you were looking for something interesting to paint in the sort of demonic realm this would be something to go and check out paint for yourself so yeah very cool yeah slap a lot of contrast on that it'll be fine yeah or or paint it properly you know one or the other there's so much detail on that yeah yes. it is crazy even things like the um split jaw that sort yeah. of thing so it opens like a flower yeah although yeah. I, I love the the warp portal built into his shield there is very mm. very cool within that that screaming maw that might it's just be a sphincter cool. it, it could be a sphincter <laughs> it might be a sphincter it's probably a sphincter I, you're I, right jerry of course you're right I, I imagine that's just a living creature that he's got strapped to his arm yeah possibly yeah. I will say that this is uh, only limited to 300 pieces. I think there's around 230, 220 left. So if you want to get involved with this, just in case it starts to blow up over the last couple of days mm, and you're yeah. really interested in the model, make sure to go and check it out on Kickstarter. But yeah, yeah. looks very, very cool indeed. So, yeah. yeah, Super fine detail on like the, the chain mail and the roughness of the armor, which is very cool. Mm. Yes. And then, yeah. oh, wow, he's got a lot of skulls. <laughs> skulls for As- days. As, as any good demon has, they have multiple skulls all over the place. They have skulls on their kneecaps, they have skulls on their heads, they have skulls on their tabards, they have skulls underfoot. Skulls on their cloaks, skulls for days. Uh, uh, yeah. Skull armor. <laughs> skull armor, yeah. yeah. Skeletal would be pleased, I think. <laughs> uh, gorgeous, gorgeous work. Definitely mm. one to check out if you want a, a really nice collector's piece. And you say there's only ever going to be 300 of these made on the entire planet, Ben? Uh, as part of this initial Kickstarter, yes. Maybe there'll be some more in the future, but that's the original sort of run that he's looking at to create this model. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more stuff in the future because this one's done very successfully. Mm. Right. Sweet to the beat. Yeah. All right, well, uh, if that is everything, I think I may call it for the day, gents. So just a reminder, everybody, no weekend or next week, we will be running our 40K hobby event. So come along and join us for all of the cool content we're going to be making for that. If you're one of the people who has a digital ticket, don't forget, get into the project systems, make sure and tag your project properly so we can actually keep an eye on it, maybe show it off a little bit through the weekend. And, of course, you have that chance to win HN Sword Kit. Everybody who's coming along, we're looking forward to seeing you very soon. We're working really hard to get the tables finished. He'll be teaching you how to play. <laughs> He'll be teaching you how to play. <laughs> Teach you how to play uh, Saga. <laughs> wrong event. <laughs> uh, make sure and come across and join us tomorrow morning on ontabletop.com for the Weekender XLBS, which is another version of this show where you're going to have some of us from the team sitting down, have a chat about the hobby, what we've been up to, some of the cool things that have been sent in recently. We will now move on, and uh, yeah, we will see you another time. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.